Hi, I'm Sal Mercaglano, Associate Professor of History at Campbell University in North Carolina, a former merchant mariner, and I teach a course in maritime industry policy for the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy. Uh, welcome to this episode of Maritime Industry Today, a special episode. We were going to film it yesterday, but things in the Suez kind of preempted it, so filming it today. It's April 15th, uh, and what I want to talk about today is the evolution of container ships and how we wound up with vessels like Ever Given, these huge, ultra-large container vessels. Uh, I'm going to give you a lot of material and sources today, and feel free to delve into them, look into them. Don't take my word for it. I'm a historian. One of the things I teach my students all the time is to dig into sources, get as many sources as you can to try to find out what's the best information and what's out there on, on, on a topic. Uh, and so that's something I try to do all the time. Uh, try to list my sources, try to identify them. I give you links to them so that you can go and check up on them yourself. Don't always take my word for it. God, don't take my word for it. Just just always don't take anybody's word for anything. Always, always double check everything. So anyway, today we're going to talk about container ships. So a couple of things I wanted to make you aware of right off the bat. Some good sources to delve into if you want more than just a 15 minute YouTube video, for example. So first, two great books. Uh, one is this one right here. This is Mark Levinson. Let me see if I get that in there for you. There you go. Mark Levinson's book, uh, How the Shipping Container Made the World Smaller and the World Economy Bigger. Came out in 2006. The two books I'm going to show you right now both came out in 2006. That was the 50th anniversary of containerization. So this book, great general primer. I, I, I recommend this book very strongly. Again, written in 2006, so it's missed the last 15 years of what's happening. But I'm going to fill that in for you today. Uh, the other book is this one right here. This is Brian Cudahy's book, Box Boats, How Container Ships Change the World. A more wonky book, I would tell you. Uh, deals a lot more in details about vessels and vessel specifications. Uh, deals a lot with uh, 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 Sealand, uh, the entity that Malcolm McLean, uh, the person who basically is acknowledged as the founder of containerization, goes into. So you get a lot of charts in here with vessel specifications and 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 tables and stuff like that. So a much more kind of wonky book. If you really want the details, this is the one. If you want a good general read, I would do Levinson's book. The other book I'll recommend here is a general book because I have a fa fairly large American audience and I apologize to everyone who's who's not in the United States and I'll talk about that in, in another video. But if you're interested in the U.S. Merchant Marine, decline of U.S. Merchant Marine and why we're talking about a lot of ships and companies that are overseas and not U.S., then I'd recommend this book right here. This is Rene de la Pedra's The Rise and Decline of U.S. Merchant Shipping in the 20th Century. Out of print now, but you can usually find used copies and old copies uh, fairly easily for that. So I think they're really good for that. So anyway, let's uh, jump in here. And again, I'm going to give you uh, lots of uh, material and sources here. But again, all this will be in the show notes. So feel free to look into and delve into whatever you want. Let me come over here first. So talk about Malcolm McLean a second ago. Malcolm McLean uh, was a truck driver, actually owned a trucking company, not really so much a truck driver. Uh, and in 1956, he developed the, the initial concept of containerization. There's a great little video here that you can delve into about in five minutes, how containerization shaped the world. And I'll put another video in here specifically about McLean. McLean actually grew up not too far from where I live today in North Carolina. And obviously, uh, just tremendous. Harvard Business lists him as one of the 100 most in influential people of the 20th century because of his invention of containerization, the concept of what we call today intermodalism. Pack a, a shipping container, be able to load it on the back of a truck, a, a railway, uh, put it onto a vessel, and then do in reverse what we know happens with intermodal transport today. It, it, it's absolutely revolutionary. Uh, because now you can move goods for almost no money on the transportation costs. And more importantly, we can move things fairly rapidly as opposed to the way things used to be moved. And, and we'll talk about that. The other video here is one from the Wall Street Journal. This is, how, uh, this is from their uh, brief history on business. And one of the things they talked about here is how a steel box changed the world, a brief history of shipping. So they go a little bit more in depth than that prior one. That prior one was a TED Talk, a very brief little one, a little five minutes. This one's also another five minute one. But again, two quick little videos if you want to give you a kind of a little primer on it. They're good. Uh, I've watched them both. I, I think they're, you know, they appeal to different groups. Uh, so whichever one you're interested in uh, about it. So why did we go containerization? Why did we go for the idea here of containerization? So containerization came around because the old way to move goods is this way, break bulk. Uh, individual pieces moved individually. Uh, this is a classic break bulk 
image here from the top of a deck of a vessel inside the hold full with bags, boxes, maybe pallets. But it was very difficult to move goods. Uh, if you think about a, a, a Liberty ship from World War II, for example, the standard freighter from World War II, 441 feet long, it can carry 10,000 tons of goods. Well, Ever Given is 1,300 feet long. You can literally put three Liberty ships inside of her uh, lengthwise and uh, about three wide across her. But more importantly, she can move Ever Given 200,000 tons of goods and move it not just more efficiently, but they can offload and load them a lot faster than what you're seeing here. This would take a five days or so to, to offload more to load in some cases. And, and so one of the things that you've seen that's changed right now is vessels spend more time at sea than in port, which is a big thing. Now we're not seeing that right now because of slowdowns in, in, in the ports, but that's a big thing. The other reference sources I'm gonna really direct you to are a couple of great ones. This is the geography of, of transport systems here. Uh, Jean-Paul Rodrigues, uh, Rodrigue uh, does this. He posts this online. Uh, I recommend this. I'll put this in the show notes. This is great. If you want to learn about the geography of transport systems, uh, this is the, the, the material to go to. He makes this available for education uses, which is fantastic. Uh, uh, full credit to him on this. Absolutely just an amazing thing. You'll see right here the table of contents, transport and geography, transport spatial structure, economy and society, energy and, uh, and environment, transportation terminals. He also does another one here on port economics management and policy. Again, strongly recommend take a look at this. You'll spend hours delving through the different chapters and he's got subsections in here and links and it's great. It's fantastic stuff, stuff I, I, I eat up all the time. So I'm going to use part of this actually right here, right now. So one of the one sections he has in his geography of transport systems is this one, a section on maritime transport. And I'm just going to show you very briefly this because I think it's great. As I said before, he's got these great illustrations and charts in here, which are just fantastic, just absolutely, absolutely fantastic. This is required book for my uh, advanced level course in maritime industry policy. We go over this book initially. And I think it's great. Uh, make my students get a copy of it, have a hard copy of it, talk about it, talk about uh, uh, domains of maritime circulation and choke points. There's the old Suez right there. One of those big kind of choke points right there. Uh, talks about all these different elements. And again, I, I can't talk enough about it. So, you know, if you want to know about types of, um, of maritime cargo, he has that in there. Uh, he talks about all the different modes of transportation. Uh, he's got an evolution of container ships, which we're going to delve into here in a second goes into maritime shipping, talks about all the different aspects of maritime shipping, economics involved with it. Absolutely fantastic. Great little chart here on maritime transport cycle from ship construction to use to scrapping. Again, just, just good material. Again, go right to sources that have great material. And here you go. If you want to learn about containerization or you want to learn about any aspect of maritime transport, passenger liners, bulk trade, oil, you name it. He has it in here. Great, great source to go to. So let's talk about this. This is his evolution here of, of containers, uh, a, a great little image here that he has. And he has this little chart here that starts with the early container ships. Very first container ship was a ship called the SS Ideal X, uh, 1956. Uh, it was a tanker, actually a tanker that sailed from Houston, Texas to Newark, New Jersey. And uh, Malcolm McLean realized that this idea of these modular containers that go on, on truck chassis was the way to go. And so he basically bought into a shipping firm, the Pan, uh, Pan Atlantic Waterway Company, and they bought two tankers. And the tankers would sail from Houston, Texas, up to New York to offload. This is before the Colonial Pipeline was in place. And the problem was coming back. They, didn't, they were coming back empty. And so what he put on board there was a, what's called mechano decking. It's basically a, a decking that goes over the piping. They used it in World War II to carry cargo, largely aircraft. Most aircraft traveling to Europe and, and Pacific actually rode on the deck of cargo ships, largely tankers. Uh, and on that deck, he was able to put 58 containers, 58 35-foot containers. And that was the birth of it. And over time, we've seen these container ships grow in size. We have these early container ships, which are largely modified existing cargo ships or tankers. We see the introduction of the first cellular container vessels. These are cells. In other words, the containers go into these specific cells, these tracks on board. 
we see the growth of vessels up to what's called Panama Max, which is the, the largest vessels that can go through uh, the Panama Canal. They're constrained by the locks of the Panama Canal. We saw the development of ships that exceeded the Panama Canal, what we call post Panama Max. Uh, then we saw the widening of the Panama Canal, and then we have these, what they call new Panama Max, so the, the, the new level to go through the Panama Canal that can be adjusted uh, to them. So you can adjust here. That's actually the post Panama Max 2. Then the new Panama Max are bigger than the Panama Canal. They exceed even the new locks of the Panama Canal. And then you get into the behemoths that we're talking about, the, the, the VLCC, the VLCSs, the very large container ships, the ULCSs, the ultra large container ships or container vessels. Sometimes you'll see that. And then these mega ships, these 24 cell, uh, 24 bay vessels. And let me break that down for you a little bit. There's another chart he has, which is great, uh, which gives you kind of the steps and the size and, and growth of the vessel. So just for a note here, again, 2006 right here is when these books came out. So when the box and box boats came out, that's right when you were looking at the size of vessels. And I want to take a moment here and read you a very interesting passage. This is from Mark Levinson's book, the very end of Mark Levinson's book. I'm always interested in historians and, 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 and authors and, and what they can predict here. So let me read you Mark Levinson's last paragraph in the book here. It's reading time with Dr. Sale. Whereas vessel size has once been limited by the locks in the Panama Canal, container ships have grown so large that 21st century naval architects were constrained by the Straits of Malacca. This is the Straits coming out of Singapore into the Indian Ocean. The busy shipping lane between Malaysia and Indonesia. If a container ship ever reaches Malacca max, the maximum size for a vessel able to pass through the Straits will be a quarter mile long and 190 feet wide with its bottom some 65 feet below the waterline. Real quick, uh, Ever Given is... Uh, uh, 1300 feet long that's a quarter mile wide long uh, 200 feet wide and draws 50 feet of water its capacity will be 18,000 containers enough to fill a 68 mile line of trucks each time it arrives in port uh, ever given can handle 20,000 containers the biggest ships today 24,000 uh, where it will cause a serious question because few ports anywhere deep enough to accommodate it the answer may well be brand new ports built in deep water offshore i'm going to read the last sentence here if they ever come about, these enormously costly ships and ports will create yet more economics of scale, making it still cheaper and easier to move go goods around the globe. That was Mark Levinson in 2006, and he accurately predicted what happens today. So I want to take a second and talk about these steps up, but I also want to talk about some vessels that are not in here. Again, I don't want to just use someone else's sources. I like to add some stuff in here. So 1972, uh, you see the introduction of, uh, let's skip that for a second and come back to this. Sorry. This, this is the introduction of what's called the SL7s. This is the Sealand 7 class. Uh, also by Malcolm McLean. This is old Malcolm McLean right here, looking over his empire there, the Sealand containers. And one of the things that, that McLean introduced in 1970s were these new class of vessels, what were known as the SL7s. And what made SL7 so unique, this is an image of an SL7 right there, very sleek looking, big kind of clipper bow right there, house forward, engine room aft, containers on board. She carried a little bit over a thousand containers, so not big by any means. But what made the SL7 so unique were they were fast, 33 knots, I mean fast. They were also built overseas. Uh, Sealand decided to take their business overseas. And in the 1970s, they built them overseas. Uh, they didn't get uh, money for uh, subsidies. One of the things under the old Merchant Marine Act of 1936, because it was expensive to build in the United States versus some overseas yards. Uh, he didn't accept uh, these, these differential uh, money. So he wound up building these ships in Germany and Den uh, excuse me, Netherlands, Germany and Netherlands. Uh, so he had these vessels and his plan was to put two on the Atlantic route with one crossing the Atlantic each time. So you'd have scheduled liner service and then six of them on the Pacific route. And these vessels were going to be high speed. You'd be able to cross the Atlantic and Pacific in days. And they were going to really thrust sea land into, into the forefront. Well, uh, 1973, the Yom Kippur War happens. Uh, the Suez Canal has been blocked this entire time. But more importantly, OPEC decides to embargo oil against the United States. And what you have is an escalation in oil prices. Now running these vessels at 33 knots is uneconomical. It's too expensive. The oil prices just shoot through the roof because these things guzzle gas like crazy. And so instead, he's got a slow steam, uh, about 24 knots, which is still a good speed. It's still a, a, a good speed, but it's still uneconomical because they weren't designed for that. 
And so what happens is these vessels wind up getting sold. Uh, they're too uh, expensive to operate. So what Malcolm McLean does is he sells them to the U.S. government. And these become what's called the fast sea lift ships. They were bought in the early 80s, converted into these fast sea lift ships. They were instrumental in carrying over the first heavy units of the U.S. military over to uh, Iraq in 1990, or Saudi Arabia, I should say, in 1990, and Iraq again in 2003. They're still in the reserve fleet. They're over 40 years old. One of them was just out the other day. I got a buddy who's sailing on one right now. Uh, so they're still operational, but they are getting long in the tooth. Uh, uh, they, they, they are getting very expensive uh, to operate. Uh, then we come back to, sorry, uh, we come back to, I'm going to move my chart around here so it's easier for me to maneuver. Uh, we come to the Leica class. This is uh, Maersk. Maersk is, is really one of the big groups here. You see this uh, L class, R, S, E, and Triple E. Those are all Maersk class. Maersk company is one of these companies that, that are really instrumental in basically moving things forward in the container industry. So Maersk is one of these big players and they have actually a history out. This is done by Cambridge uh, Press. This is creating global opportunities. Uh, Maersk line and containerization, 1973 to 2013. Uh, this book is dense. Uh, man, it's a tough read. I'm telling you, I love this stuff and it, it's tough for me to read. Uh, I think this is one of the problems that uh, maritime companies have. Uh, why, why doesn't Maersk make a book that's popular for everybody? It's, it's crazy. This thing is, is, is fantastic for sources. For me, I love this kind of stuff. But if you have a passing interest in it, don't read this book. Uh, that will put you to sleep. It's a very heavy book. Uh, but anyway, uh, Maersk is one of these key things. And I think that's that's important to say. So in uh, the 1980s, they come up with the L-Class, which still exists today in a very weird way because uh, th they operate here as ships in the U.S. Uh, Sealift fleet. Uh, they are the Sugar class. These are vessels that were bought by the U.S. after the Persian Gulf War of 1990-91. And they were converted uh, from container ships into what's called large, medium speed, roll on, roll off vessels. These are vessels that basically carry a lot of cargo on board. Uh, but these were the L class. These were the uh, Maersk vessels. And uh, they're impressive ships. Uh, but again, they're getting a little bit old in the tooth here right now. Uh, been around a long time and just are, are, are not what uh, um, really uh, uh, tough to keep going. But in the time when they came out, they were massive, 3,400 TUs. Remember, uh, you're looking at vessels carrying 1,000, maybe 2,000 boxes tops. And then all of a sudden, you have Maersk come out with the L-Class. It was really a, a phenomenal step up. Uh, the next one you saw here is the C-10 class. This is 4,500 boxes. This is from American President's line. Uh, American President's line has a, a, a long history with the United States. Uh, they were actually a derivation uh, from the old uh, dollar line. Uh, and uh, American President's line has a very long history. All the vessels are named for presidents. Uh, very, very specific presidents, too. I'll mention you don't have every president listed, but very spe uh, specific presidents. And uh, APL in 1988 built this. This is the, the D-10s. And again, this, this class of vessel right here, excuse me, the C-10s, these are C-10s. Uh, the C-10s uh, built in, in, in Germany, uh, largely. Uh, massive vessels, really impressive. Uh, basically being able to carry about 4,500 containers. Uh, they were diesel powered, uh, which is what the trend is you see, away from steam power and the diesel power, more fuel efficient, uh, able to operate uh, in, in, in a very unique way. They, they are, 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 are really impressive vessels. And one of the reasons you saw them come out and, and you see them come out here right at the end of the 80s, because prior to this, there was a company called US Lines. And US Lines was a company that was actually bought by Malcolm McLean. Uh, McLean bought that line and built a new type of vessel. So Malcolm McLean had gotten back. He was in shipping the entire time. Obviously, the SL7s did not work out for him. So he was able to pawn them off on the Navy, sell them. They convert them into the fast sea lift ships because of a need to get military cargoes to the Middle East after the Iranian crisis. Well, McLean comes up with a new idea. He's able to procure and join into U.S. lines. U.S. lines is bought and becomes a subsidiary along with Sealand. And his new idea is around the world service. He's going to build these new vessels. These are going to be built over in Korea, Daewoo, the, the Daewoo dozen, as they were referred to initially. Uh, Twelve of them, uh, they're, they're known by, by U.S. firms as the econo ships because the, their key thing was economy. 
they're big ships. I mean, you're talking about 5,000, 6,000 box vessels. So they're very big ships, but more importantly, they were designed for slow steaming. I mean, slow steaming, 16 knots. Uh, that is slow. You're looking at most container ships today, 20 to 24 knots is what they're looking at. Uh, these vessels were slow. They were going to go in around the world. They basically would start on the East Coast of the United States, and every few days they would take off and do around the world. And that was their pad. That was their route. That was around the world. So there'd be these vessels along the way providing around the world service. And <clears throat> it was innovative. It was it was tremendous. These ships were were state of the art. I mean, they were beautiful. You still see some of them floating around. A lot of these ships actually you still see floating around, obviously, in, in different versions. Uh, the C-10s for APL are still, some are still out there. Some have been scrapped. Some are, are flying a, a foreign registry out there. Uh, the Econo ships were just for U.S. lines were going to be their, their, the centerpiece for this around the world service. Well, unfortunately, there was a uh, upstart Taiwanese line by the name of Evergreen uh, who had a better idea. And, and what they built was a series of vessels that were faster. And more importantly, they did east and west service around the world. So instead of just 12 ships going eastward around the world, they had 24 ships that went eastward and westward. And they did it for a lower cost. Because again, McLean did not take any differentials from the government, any subsidies. Uh, and so he was basically forced. And matter of fact, it was the demise of US lines in 1986 that really marks the end of uh, uh, Philip Pedro's book on the decline of the merchant marine, uh, the US maritime industry, I should say. So when we come back here again, again, you have the C-10s in here, you throw in the uh, um, the Econo ships here, and then your next big jump here is, is the R-Class, the Regina class. Uh, R-Class, again, is another step up. But, you know, you see these steps up here quite a bit. Uh, and, and again, they seem to be small in size. Uh, the R-Class are still out there today, uh, operated by Maersk as the K-Class, uh, one of the K-Classes. You'll see them out there uh, operating right now. Uh, here's a ver uh, little information on her right there. But again, a next step up. And again, what we're seeing is these slow progressions right here. Then you have a big jump up here in the early, uh, late 90s, early 2000s, the Sovereign class, the uh, S class come out. Here you go. Here are the Sovereigns right now. Uh, fairly big ships, just under 100,000 tons, around 90,000 tons, uh, over 1,100 feet long, big vessels, over 8,000, 9,000 uh, TUs, which you're looking at right there. Uh, and what we saw recently is the very first of these being scrapped. The very first one went into Turkey the other uh, not too long ago. The Sin uh, Maersk uh, was scrapped uh, after basically 20 years of service. Uh, and again, because uh, she was not profitable for Maersk, we start seeing these vessels start uh, going out here. And again, this is basically where, uh, again, those two books, uh, the, the books by Levinson and Cudahy stop. But then you see the quantum leap here, the, the, just the absolute jump here. And you come to Emma Maersk, uh, the E-class container ships. And Emma Maersk was just a, 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 a tremendous leap above everything else. Uh, built at the Odense uh, Steel uh, Shipyard. Uh, again, this was the uh, yard that was used uh, by Denmark, by Maersk almost all the time. It doesn't exist anymore. Uh, Maersk builds almost all their vessels today overseas in Korea. Uh, again, 90 4% of all commercial ships are built in China, Japan, Korea, and the Philippines, 90% in, in, in those top three countries without the Philippines. But here are the E-Class. And the E-Class grabbed a lot of attention because they were such a big, huge leap in size. I mean, now all of a sudden you, you have these vessels that are just massive. I mean, they just, they just again, quantum leap again, look at the chart right here and you see the, the, the leap here, you know, you're jumping from 8,000, box vessels to 12,500, again, almost a 50% increase. And at the time it was seen as, as, as massive. And again, Maersk is the master of public affairs here. Uh, they came out, this is when this book came out for them. Uh, they did a documentary on it. Uh, they, they were, they knew how to sell this. They knew how to sell this and Maersk was really good about it. And they were able to get them out there and put them in service in a very short period of time. The very first one was delivered the end of August, 2006, the last one in, in January of 2008. But then they leaped again. Again, you see this leap that they do right here. And you go from 12,500 to the triple E's. And the triple E's, again, were another step up. Again, they were talking about the economy of scale, energy efficient, and environmentally improved. And these vessels are over 18,000 containers. These are the ones that uh, my, my uh, little container ship right up there. You can see it right there. There you go. My little Maersk uh, Lego container ship back there. That's what they did. They did a huge... Roll out with this. They invited people to the launching. 
of the vessel. It was, it, it was massive. But these vessels weren't built, by the way, in Denmark. They're built in Korea, Daewoo, the same ones that built the Econo ships back for Malcolm McLean and U.S. lines are building the Maersk Triple E's right here. 20 vessels. 20 vessels are built. And just to put you in the scale here, the first one is delivered in July of 2013. The last one, the last one in June of 2015. That gives you an idea there. Two years to build 20 vessels. And, and these, again, were 18,000 box vessels. At the time, people thought that was it. We've reached the max capacity that we can do. But no, we didn't. Because what we saw then is these ultra large container vessels. What Maersk sparked was kind of the, the, the container race uh, of, of the 21st century. We've had the space race to get to the moon, spice race to get to the Far East. And now we have the, the, the space race in terms of container space. Uh, they are basically trying to maximize the, the the volume of their vessels. This is container ships on 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 steroids or Viagra, whatever you want to use as your analogy. These vessels are just tremendously large. And again, when you look at this 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 scale right here, it's going off the top. Twenty four thousand boxes. Uh, the biggest ones uh, we've seen here is is the creation of these monsters. This is from Maritime Insight. The top ten vessels right here. Uh, coming in here, and they list the top 10. Here you see HMN Algeciras. Again, uh, HMM line, which is uh, used to be the old Hyundai Merchant Marine. Uh, now it's just HMM. Sorry, I got ads popping up here. Uh, 24,000. They built these ships, a dozen vessels, 1,300 feet long in two years. Again, uh, that's that's three miles of vessels they built. It's, it's, it's an insane number. And again, there are many of these vessels under contract right now. Uh, you can see them all here. And, and again, what we're seeing are these ultra large container ships in, in differenting sizes, uh, differentiating firms, all doing the same. Uh, Maersk followed with the, with the improved Triple E. Those are 11 of them uh, that they added on to their original Triple E. There's the Ever Golden. That is Ever Given Sister Ships right there, uh, class right there. And you just see the birth of these ships. And they're tremendous. And again, I'll have links to all these so you can dig in here and take a look at them. But now all of a sudden you see this growth. So today, this is as of today, this is Alpha Liner's top 100. There are over 6,000 container ships with 24.5 million TEUs. Put this into proportion in 1990, 1990. So we're talking 31 years ago. The capacity of container ships on the world today was 1.5 million. Uh, in 2000, it's 4.3 million. That's by the way, the exact size of basically Maersk Line today. In 2008, it's 10.6 million. In 2012, 15.4 million. In 2017, 20.3 million. And in 2021, 24.5 million. We're seeing growths of 5 million TEUs every couple of years now. So we're expecting to see, you know, we can be at 30 million TEUs in 2025, 2026, if, if growth continues. And if you look here closely at this chart, and I'll magnify it a little bit for you to make it a little easier for everybody to see. Uh, if you look at the chart here, you know, expected growth, Mediterranean shipping is, 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 is growing their, their fleet right there. They're going to expand CMA, Costco, Hopal Gloyd, ONE, and the big one is Evergreen. Evergreen has is, is got a huge expansion. Evergreen's been one of the lar longest container operators in the world. They have a long history of operating container ships. Uh, and you see them grow up, HMM, uh, Yangmin, Zim, which is Zim is, is the Israeli uh, uh, line. Uh, Pill is 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 the Philip is, is is excuse me uh, Singapore, but it's really the top nine that are in those big alliances that are growing and and expanding, and that's how containerization has changed. Even from two excellent books written in two thousand six, uh, they're out of date and they need to be updated because again, what we've seen is this traumatic increase in the size of container vessels, and what that means then is uh, come back over here to the map I wanted to show you earlier. This is also from uh, Jean-Paul Rodrigue's uh, site where he uses the uh, Panama Canal and Suez Canal as examples of why you need this economy of scale, why, the, why there's, there's races to build. When the Panama Canal was expanded and opened in 2016 with a new line, they were building to basically 
uh, not the newest vessels, not not the Emma class. Uh, they were basically, you know, hoping maybe that would be the peak there. They thought that that was going to be the peak that can handle vessels of that size. We can handle Emma class vessels, comparable vessels, and you see it kind of plateaued there. So that when they opened in 2016, their initial plan was to handle that. But instead, what has happened, they've increased in size. So the Panama Canal cannot handle them. That's one of the reasons why you're hearing this talk about a Nicaraguan canal, uh, because that canal would be much larger, able to handle these larger vessels. And it's why the Suez Canal has expanded. They don't want these ultra large container vessels going the Cape route because that's loss of revenue for them. They'd much rather them have them come through the Suez. But it is, as we've seen with every given, a dangerous prospect because of the size and limitations of the canal for these vessels. So that's a quick little rundown. I'm sorry if it was too complicated. I, I try to keep this kind of entertaining and, and light and easy. Uh, so hopefully you found it good. Again, I recommend a lot of those sources I did, uh, I had there for you. I'll have all the links available to you. You can link over to them, take a look at them, uh, feel free to do some more research. Uh, the plenty of videos on YouTube that talk about containerization and I'll link some more later on. And hopefully next week I'll have another special for you guys. And in the meantime, uh, tomorrow I'll have an update on Every Given. I'll also be filming the second episode with John Conrad of G Captain of G Captain Weekly. Uh, that'll be out on Sunday, talking about a lot of stories in the news beyond Ever Given. So uh, there was a, a tragic loss of a, a drill platform in the Gulf of Mexico that's going on. Uh, we've got issues uh, with reports from the Port of Los Angeles. Their quarterly report came out with what's going on with the backlog in that port and a lot of other news that we're going to touch base on. So if you want to get a nice little recap, start the week off and what happened in, in, in Maritime, go, hop on over to G Captain. Look at G Captain Weekly. We'll have that second episode out on Sunday. So thanks again for watching. Again, if you like the channel and, and you're enjoying it, please, you know, subscribe, uh, you know, hit the bell so you'll be alerted when new videos come out. Uh, feel free to comment. Uh, I will happily comment on, on topics I feel comfortable commenting on and I have sources on. Those that I don't, I just will not comment on. I'm sorry. Uh, so anyway, I hope you like it. I hope you enjoy it. If you have ideas for future videos too, let me know. Uh, happy to do that too. Uh, and uh, I'm enjoying the opportunity to talk about the maritime industry, which I've done a lot of time working in and researching on. So thanks for uh, tuning in and I'll see you on the next episode of Maritime Industry Today.